On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome to the program Mark Mazzetti. He is the national security reporter for the New York Times and author of the book The Way of the Knife. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. All right. So, um, you know, we've talked uh, uh, over the past couple of days of the speech that Dianne Feinstein gave on the uh, on the floor of the Senate, um, speaking uh, essentially catching, I guess, the rest of us up to speed in terms of this brewing conflict between the Senate Intelligence Committee and the CIA. This story seems to start really uh, back in in 05, doesn't it? Sure, and um, and 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 that's an interesting place to start because De- De- Senator Feinstein made a point in her speech on Tuesday of raising the issue of the 2005 destruction of interrogation videotapes that the CIA, um, a, a senior CIA officer in 2005, destroyed a number of tapes showing the interrogations of two Al Qaeda detainees. And that was at a time when the courts were looking at the interrogation issue, and as well as um, the, these tapes had also been destroyed uh, without being shown to the 9-11 Commission. Now, Senator Feinstein on Tuesday referenced this to point out that her committee needed to hold on to certain records about the detention and the interrogation program um, because the CIA made a, might have destroyed them. So it was this extraordinary moment um, on Tuesday where she was laying out the whole narrative. And it's a long and complicated story, but if you look at um, that point of the destruction of tapes and then flash forward a couple, hour, a couple years later um, when she began her report, you begin to understand the sort of years of struggle that this has been to get this report out. Here we are in 2014, the report's still not out, and she's alleging that the agency was monitoring the computers of of uh, committee staff. So the uh, so so back in 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 05 when you know we had uh, begun to see the the outlines of what the uh, CIA um, torture program is. I mean I don't know wh- what the um, what the the New York Times style book is on this, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I I you know from my perspective anyways uh, it, it was clearly a, a torture program and. Uh, so you had a, a uh, the head of one of the clandestine bureaus, I guess it was, Rodriguez, who uh, destroyed these tapes. He did so under what authority and and, 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 and granted by whom, I guess, is the issue because these uh, this player comes back into uh, one, one of the people, is my understanding, who provided that authority still in the picture. Right. So in 2005, Rodriguez, who at that time was the head of the CIA's clandestine service, basically the top um, undercover spy for the agency, um, ordered the destruction of the tapes. Now, he got a sign-off um, from two lawyers inside the clandestine service. Uh, one of them is a man named Robert Edinger. And uh, from what we know and from what Rodriguez has said, um, Edinger basically told him, you are in your uh, authorities to destroy these tapes. Now, Edinger didn't say, go ahead and do it, but he certainly said, you're in your rights to do it. Now, Edinger, Jose Rodriguez has since left the CIA, but Robert Edinger has stayed in the CIA and continues to sort of move up the ranks of the um, uh, CIA's general counsel's office and is now the acting general counsel of the CIA. And he's now a pretty critical player in in the current episode, because as Feinstein pointed out on Tuesday, although she didn't use his name, he made a criminal referral to the Justice Department um, about her staff and whether they may have broken the law by um, gaining access to certain internal documents. And basically she was saying, you know, there's a real conflict of interest here. We cite this guy 1,600 times in our report, and now he's making a criminal referral about our staff. Yeah, and, and I want to I want to circle back to Edinger uh, as well, because he, um, he be, prior to the time where he was um, uh, in a position to say you're within, uh, you, you have no. Uh, I, I guess, I guess the way that it was it was framed on some level was like you have no legal liability if you destroy these tapes. Uh, so he he got his lawyer's permission. Uh, I guess is really uh, what it comes down to. But he was also, my understanding is, he was also uh, one of. Um, 
the chief counsel for the counterterrorism unit, and um, th- under which, before the tapes were made, I guess, they got authorization to perform the acts that were t- that took place on the tape. But, but let's circle back to that. And so 2005, that takes us up to when did the, uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee begin to undertake this report on, uh, on the uh, enhanced interrogation or the torture regime under the CIA? They began in 2009, uh, shortly after President Obama came in. So Obama came in in the first week of office, signed this executive order to close the secret prisons and end the techniques. Um, and the uh, Senate started its work soon afterwards. And a deal was struck between Feinstein and then CIA Director Leon Panetta um, about how this would proceed. That um, the, the CIA, Panetta agreed to hand over effectively millions of documents about the program for the Senate to carry out its investigation. But the deal was that if they were going to look at these documents, they were going to have to go to this CIA facility in Northern Virginia and, um, and look at them there and use computers that were basically part of a CIA network. And so that's how this uh, proceeded for several years. A group of investigators went in, they poured over the documents, they worked on the report, and they worked on the report for about three years. Give it. Give us a sense. I mean, so this did not play, take place at, at Langley. It took place at um, some office building uh, that was leased by, by the CIA. And then they what? They, they installed computers there and hooked it into their network. Is that basically it? Yeah. So um, I, I I don't know exactly where the facility is. It's it's I think somewhere near you know CIA headquarters in Langley. Um, it is a uh, as someone described it, it is a uh, supposed to be a sort of clandestine uh, building, except you have CIA police officers guarding it out front with marked cars saying CIA. Um, and so there's a uh, basement uh, windowless room uh, which came to be known as the electronic reading room, where uh, these documents were basically fed into the room on, into a computer system, and there was a what was called a segregated network drive, allowing the committee staff to look at uh, the documents. So there was a basically part, uh, um, a segregated part of the CIA system that the committee was using and a firewall was set up, the idea being that the CIA couldn't go in and look on the Senate's part of the uh, side of the firewall, and the Senate couldn't go to the other side of the firewall and look at other things the CIA didn't want them to look at. And how has Feinstein characterized the the documents that they got uh, access to? Well, basically she said that these millions of documents um, uh, that they based their report on present a picture of a program that um, not only uh, was ineffective in getting uh, intelligence about um, al-Qaeda, uh, but also characterizing how you know, the CIA kind of was lying throughout the, uh, the whole time, um, inflating the uh, effectiveness of these techniques. Um, there were guys in the field who were lying to headquarters. Headquarters was lying to the White House, um, presenting an inaccurate picture of the program. And you know, this is all based on what we can glean because, of course, the report itself is still right. classified. And, and, and she said, I mean, uh, she's basically characterized this, uh, in my understanding, as a just a massive document dump with no indexing, just essentially buried. They gave uh, the committee investigators access to literally millions, right, of documents without right. any sort of organizational structure, uh, but for, you know, I guess what would be the equivalent of, like, my spotlight search on my, uh, on my Macintosh. Yeah, ex- exactly. So, so, so someone hands you four million documents, right, and, and without any kind of chronology or rhyme or reason, um, and you got to figure out how to make a ha- get a handle on, on it. And we, we did something when we got out the WikiLeaks documents, same thing happened. You get hundreds of thousands of documents, and you don't really know what to do with it. So what you do is you set up a search function. You basically start searching for what you're interested in. And what Feinstein described on Tuesday was basically they asked the CIA for some tool uh, 
with which they could search these documents. And so the CIA gave them some kind of computer search mechanism to allow them to sift through the documents. And that's what they did. They basically ran search queries for a number of times, uh, uh, you know, to, to be able to determine, to get their arms around exactly what they've, what they've, what they've received from the CIA. So, 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 now, so then what happens? I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, walk us through the the uh, what happened in terms of investigators finding documents, what they did with those documents and why they did what they did with those documents based upon what they started to notice was happening to documents that they thought were relevant. So really what's critical here is this document what has, which has been come to be known as the Panetta Review. And what that is is a... Um, uh, when Panetta, the CIA, gave these millions of documents to the committee, Panetta ordered um, the CIA to carry out its own assessment of the documents. In other words, we're giving the committee four million documents. We should know what's in them. So there was an internal effort by the CIA to get a handle on what these documents were. And, and there were a number of, of what we understand are, are memos, basically, um, summarized in documents and giving some analysis. Um, it is Feinstein's claim and the claim of other members of the Intelligence Committee that this internal review very much is in, in line with the conclusions of the committee's own report and at odds with the CIA's rebuttal to the Intelligence Committee's report. In other words, they've got this internal report that says something very different than John Brennan is saying publicly um, or that John Brennan is telling the committee. And they thought that that was a pretty key document. Now, um, one of the extraordinary things that she said on Tuesday was that they found, starting in 2010, the CIA was taking documents off the server. Documents they had given the committee were all of a sudden disappearing. And one of the documents that had disappeared was this Panetta review um, at one point. So what she said that they did was they um, took a copy of, or copies of parts of that Panetta review, which they thought would be pretty critical, and they um, removed it not only from the server, uh, but they removed it physically from that basement office and brought the, those documents to the Hart Senate office building, which is where the committee has its headquarters. And the reason why she said they did that was, first of all, because she said all these documents were disappearing from the computer servers, and also because the CIA's history of destroying records, notably the interrogation tapes. So she said in order to protect and preserve the Panetta Review, we had to take it away from the CIA. So, it's a pretty extraordinary you know, accusation. And, and so, all right, so, I mean, you know, and I know that uh, that uh, not all of this is uh, is known at this point, but just so that we can really be clear on what the dynamic was, you've got investigators going in, they're, they're sifting through this huge um, a pile of documents, a digital pile of documents. They come across one that is um, uh, relevant, they think. Uh, they, in some way, I guess, mark it or save it locally on, I don't know, their desktop in this, this CIA facility. At one point, some of these investigators start to realize, hey, I saved this document from uh, 2003, uh, and it's gone now. Uh, and it, it, so at that point, they start to realize the CIA is clawing back different documents. Um, do... W do you have I characterized that correctly? And, and, and that's what led them at that point to start to save some of these documents, maybe on thumb drives or uh, as printouts. Um, and, and A, have I characterized that correctly? And B, what uh, at what point was, you know, I mean, I guess what happened at that point when they realized that, that this is clawing back? They, they go to the CIA and say, hey, what's going on here? Um, yeah, it's a good question, and some of it, some of it, we we still don't know. I mean, Feinstein said on Tuesday that it was in 2010 they started noticing that a bunch of documents had gone missing. Um, at what point they decided to preserve this Panetta review and move it um, is unclear. I think that narrative is. I mean, there's still still. Uh, sort of holes in that narrative that we're trying to fill in. Um, the documents in question um, are primarily from, um, I mean, the, the documents that got taken out of the system 
could be an, over a number of years. The Panetta review started in around 2009 because Panetta didn't get into office into, until 2009. So when the committee started made the decision, as you said, to start preserving some of these documents, um, we don't know that yet. But what we do know is that um, there is now at uh, this dispute about whether the Panetta review was ever given to the committee, in other words, in that massive document dump, or whether the committee went behind the firewall and found it. Um, that's one of the things that's in dispute now. Now, Feinstein said Tuesday that it was part of the massive document dump. They got it fair and square, and they used the search function, and they got the document. Um, the agency is making some claim that they did something untoward in order to get that document. Now, this is, I mean, th just uh, to isolate this, we have um, the CIA claiming that these Senate uh, investigators essentially hacked into uh, the CIA servers uh, in a way that was unauthorized to get this uh, Panetta review. Meanwhile, um, because there's another half uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the idea of hacking into people's computers, um, we had... Uh, Brennan yesterday, I guess it was, saying the idea that we would have hacked into Senate uh, Senate investigators' computers is just beyond imaginable. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, am I characterizing that right as well? I mean, the, the idea that, that, that Brennan is saying it's unimaginable that CIA agents would infiltrate uh, somebody else's computer, but we're charging that... Uh, Senate investigators did that to us. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, to put it in shorthand, you're right. I mean, both sides are kind of accusing each other of spying on each other, right? And so Brennan is saying, although he's not saying a whole lot publicly, but the agency is making the case that the the committee went to places in the system that where they shouldn't have gone, and that there's been a criminal referral from the CIA's general counsel office to the Justice Department making allegations about the committee staff, that they went into parts of the – it's our understanding that it's, they're making the, claim, making the claim that the committee staff went into parts of the system where they shouldn't have, and they also took these documents away from the facility when they shouldn't have. Um, and we should say, when you say uh, CIA's general counsel, again, reminder people, that's Eatinger, right? Yeah, Robert Bobby Eatinger, yes, correct. And um, – and, 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 and so then you have, on the other side, um, there is an admission on both sides. Both sides agree that the CIA, as a result of this, um, went to, into the system where the committee was working and checked the, what they call the audit logs, the logs of, of where people were going in the system as sort of a monitoring device to basically find, that any computer system has about what, what users are doing in the system, but also seemed to have at least according to Feinstein, gone through the work product, the content of its report. Um, and now, so now, now, that's an important distinction, right? Because um, on one hand, the CIA, uh, all parties uh, stipulate that the CIA essentially um, monitored what, um, what the committee had accessed while they were in that CIA leased facility. Feinstein is charging that they went beyond that and actually broke in, essentially, to the computers that were are probably in some Senate, uh, in, in wherever, I, I don't know what building, uh, which Senate building the Intelligence Committee staff in. But, but they're saying that they, uh, Feinstein's saying saying that they also, they also broke into our computers on a completely separate uh, system, obviously, to see what we had. Is that right? No, I, actually, I don't think there's an allegation that they, that they broke into um, the congressional computer networks. And I think it's probably an important distinction to make. She is saying, though, that, that, that they were working in the CIA system, but they had a segregated part of the system with which to do their work. And the CIA was... Um, went in and looked at what they were doing um, inside that network. And here's how sort of someone likened it to me. It's sort of the, the analogy someone used, that if you go into a library and you check out a whole lot of books to write a term paper, um, the library can – it's one thing for the library to um, see which books you checked out. 
Um, it's another thing to go into your laptop to look at the third, that the term paper you wrote based on those books. And that's sort of, and, and to, to sort of explain what that means in this case, it's not just looking at what documents they looked at in among the millions and millions of documents. It's looking at their report and seeing how they use those documents. And, and it's a pretty, it's, it's sort of one in the committee's mind is significantly more important than the other. Well, no, but where would they, where would they, okay, I mean, okay, so one is basically they're looking at the metadata of what was accessed. The other is they're looking at the analysis and the way that they're piecing this stuff Correct. together. But where would they have seen where they're piecing it together? I mean, these, these committee staffers aren't writing the reports in that, uh, on a computer system that would ostensibly be connected to the CIA server, Right. No, they are. So they are basically working on the document at this facility, on this network. Um, it's my understanding that that is where that was, that was part of the deal. Now, they may be doing some separate work back in their headquarters on the Hill, okay. but most of it is being done at this CIA facility. Um, again, there's still stuff we don't know, right? But, but that's, what, um, that's sort of how Feinstein was describing it on Tuesday. And in fact, she referred that breach of the firewall, or correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is she referred that breach of the firewall by the CIA to the uh, Department of Justice as well. Well, right. I mean, so, so there has been a separate referral. Technically, it's been done by the Inspector General's Office of the CIA. So the CIA has a sort of internal um, watchdog organization that's supposed to keep the agency in check, and if there's if there's mis misconduct by the agency, the IG looks at it. So it's actually the inspector general that has referred that case to the Justice Department. But it's basically the allegation that the CIA improperly was monitoring the committee staff. So now you have, as you said, two separate criminal referrals to the Justice Department um, by each side in the dispute. And and so now at what uh, so at one point uh, the the committee finds this Panetta review, they begin to realize that what we have been told and presumably in closed session too right uh, by Brennan um, does not jibe with their own internal review. When did that start happening? And do and, and do you have a sense uh, through your reporting of how many times? I mean, it's I guess, you know, I don't know how you, you, you sort of calculate that, but on, on how many occasions or, or just how much lying to the committee. Uh, let me rephrase that. How many times did they make assertions to the committee that were contradicted by the Panetta review? It's, it's really impossible to know at this point because we don't. You know, the, the problem is all of these things are still classified. The, the 6,300 page report the Senate has finished, effectively finished, is still classified. The Panetta review is still classified. And so, I mean, I think until we see some of these documents and see what they assert, um, can we only then sort of answer questions about who was lying to whom, how many times? Um, it's um, and it's one of the obviously frustrating things about um, continuing to report the story is just that you know we've been writing about this effort by the Senate for so many years and here we are so many years later still not seeing the actual document. Yeah, I mean, I want to get I, I want to get to to sort of the, that document and you know I mean to the extent that we know uh, much about it, but I I remember during the course of. And, and, and forgive me because I haven't been able to sort of bring up this exchange, but th there was a couple exchanges during the course of Brennan's confirmation hearings where he, um, uh, prior to being confirmed, and of course, you know, the, the first attempt to confirm him, I guess back in 2009, was sort of scuttled uh, before there was a uh, nomination because of his involvement in, um, uh, in this uh, torture, as I uh, want to call it. Um, but uh, or at least his response to it, I guess. Um, but there was some exchanges, I think, during the confirmation hearing where um, he was asked which uh, about an internal CIA review. Were they talking about the, the Panetta review or were they talking about something different? They were talking about something different at that time, because that was a year ago. And I think the um, there's no indication I have that the committee brought up the internal Panetta review during Brennan's confirmation hearing last year. Now, Brennan, there was a separate Inspector General report done by 
the CIA, uh, the Inspector General, which was a, which most of it has been declassified. This was a 2004 report about the program, and that's very critical of the program as well. But so they may have been referring to that document. Um, you are right to point out that Brennan's role is quite interesting here. Um, he was a senior CIA official uh, at the time the program uh, came about, um, and he, but during his confirmation hearing last year, uh, said that he was always opposed to it, and he said that he privately uh, told other officials that he was opposed to it. Um, nobody has come forward to say that they remember Brennan saying it or that they remember him expressing his opposition, but that's what he said publicly. All right, so 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 now we're at this point where um, uh, we also know. I mean, when when the committee went to the CIA and said, "Hey, you know, we we've noticed this interesting uh, phenomena where we find a document that we think is relevant, and then uh, we show up a couple of weeks later and it sort of sort of disappeared." Um, there was a series of responses that the CIA gave at that point. Am I am I right? Uh, according to your reporting. That's what, right. That's what Senator Feinstein said Tuesday was that when they first started noticing that documents had gone missing, they um, got a, a series of responses to this. Um, uh, first off, uh, they deny that any documents had been taken. And then uh, the response was there was a number, uh, there were contractors at the facility, um, which is another part of this story, but that the contractors had removed them. And then there was apparently an answer, well, the White House ordered us to remove uh, the documents. And then the committee went to the White House and the White House denied it. So there is still this mystery of why these documents went missing. And and uh, so do we have a sense of what the White House's role has been in this? Because there was reporting, I guess, last night from McClatchy um, that the White House has been withholding for five years uh, more than 9000 top secret documents that the um, the Intelligence Committee has been looking for. What what do you know about that and um, and and and? What do you know about the, the 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 White House's role in, I guess, sort of acquiescing, signing off, instructing uh, the CIA to remove those documents? No, that was an interesting report about you know these th th these documents and what they're withholding. I think it's still unclear what the right White House's role has been in terms of um, uh, what the CIA has or has not given to the committee. Um, there are questions that have been asserted, but not asserted publicly. It's been in private that a lot of the documents are um, subject to executive privilege, but. The president has to assert that. The president has to say, um, I, the president, assert the constitutional executive privilege um, consideration, and that means you can't have access to that document. So really short of asserting executive privilege, um, you know, the executive branch can't withhold things uh, from the legislative branch. What we do know is that, at the very least, the White House has played a pretty hands-off role in the sense of not pushing the CIA to get this Senate report out. Um, President Obama said yesterday, again, he wants it declassified. But, um, you know, the president can do what he wants <laughs> because he's the president. So he certainly could have, some months ago, pushed the CIA to get this resolved, to get the Senate report out, um, let the CIA go ahead and put it to rebuttal out. But, um, you know, at the very least, the White House has played a hands-off role in terms of trying to get this report out. So now now these 9,000 documents, I mean, what do you have a sense of, uh, of A, what they are, and, and then I, I want you to sort of walk us through what the implications are to say that we are asserting executive privilege. Because, you know, for a, a layperson like myself and for our, our listeners, well, I mean, they've been sitting on these documents for 9,000 uh, 9, documents for five years, if, if, if the reporting is, is valid. What's the big, why don't they just say uh, executive privilege? I mean, it's a good question, and I and I and I and I don't know, and I don't know enough about what's. I don't think anyone knows yet what's in those documents or 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 or, or what they say. Do we know where they came from? I mean, were they uh, originally CIA documents that somehow the White House said we want nine thousand of those, or are they documents that were generated 
from the White House to the CIA or to they could other be agencies? they they could they could be documents that have a lot of inter you know uh, discussions between the White House and the CIA. Um, and, um, you know, I am not a lawyer, and so it's hard to, you know, so, and, and, nor an expert on executive privilege, but it's my understanding that you can assert uh, executive privilege if, it is, if you're making the case that a document is a deliberative document meant to inform policymaking that's not a final product, and it's meant to inform um, policymaking for the president. And um, and so the, the executive branch is allowed to keep documents um, that are draft documents um, from the legislative branch as a sort of, I mean, one way to think about it is sort of an attorney-client privilege thing. The CIA right. is giving advice to the president, and, 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 the, and Congress doesn't have a right to that. Now, executive privilege has you know, been asserted for years, right. and um, there's always a fight over whether the legislative branch gets something or not. And, um, and White Houses, whether they're Democratic or Republican, um, don't like to set precedent of giving Congress stuff that hasn't been given before. So um, that's the basic of executive privilege, but um, we don't know enough yet about what these documents say to say whether there is any strong case to assert executive privilege. And, and, and so, I mean, does the, does the White House, to, to exert executive privilege, do they need to make some, I mean, all right, so they make this assertion, but do they need to in any way uh, validate that assertion? In other words, like, if the committee has known that the White House, uh, and, and according to the McClatchy reporting, the White the committee has known about it since 2009, that there are 94, 9,500 documents that the White House has. Um, it's unclear whether or not the committee saw it uh, via the CIA, and then it was sequestered by the White House. I mean, it's unclear how the committee became aware of this. But if the committee is aware of it and they're asking for it, the White House has just basically been stonewalling. Why don't they just exert executive privilege? What's, is there any cost associated with that for them? You know, I, I, I mean, I, I think that um, it's a good question. I think that, you know, White House lawyers are, 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 are going to only ass- assert executive privilege if they think they have a case for it. Um, I mean, Who do they get to make that case to, though? Well, they, they would have to make the case to the Congress to say that X document or Y document is, um, is, is subject to executive privilege on these grounds. And um, so, again, so, we, don't know, we don't know enough about the documents to know whether they would have any case to assert it. So representatives of the White House meet with congressional staffers and they say, look, document uh, 9003 is between X and Y, and it was uh, on this topic, but it was deliberative, and that's why. And they've got a. I mean, that's is that like sort of the practicality of it? Yeah, I think I, you know, I think that that yes, that 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 is sort of how executive privilege gets asserted, if it were to be asserted. Okay. okay. That there would be a discussion specifically. So, for instance, this came up last year uh, during Brennan's confirmation hearing. Then um, when the Congress, the committee, was saying they wanted access to the Office of Legal Counsel memos um, about, uh, about, about killing, targeted killing using drones, what, are, what is the basis for the, what is the legal basis for the program? And, and, the, and the White House pushed back, and, and uh, White House and CIA pushed back, and they say, you, Congress, don't have a right to see those memos because they are legal memos that are meant to uh, inform a policy that the president has signed off on. And again, it's a form of attorney-client uh, privilege that, um, that the legislative branch doesn't have any authority to see. And ultimately, Congress backed down. They didn't push harder, and they approved Brennan. Um, but so that's just another example of, of, of how this has recently been asserted. Okay, so, so now we have this 6,300-page uh, report by the Senate. That has been finished now for at least over a year, right? Um, what, why, what, what needs to happen before we can see this? Good question. It's um, uh, you know the CIA is now in saying, well, the Senate hasn't finished it yet, and they haven't officially sent it to us for declassification. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a he said, she said here. I mean, I, it's going to be formally voted on by the Intelligence Committee. 
Um, and then when it's voted by the Senate Intelligence Committee, it will go to the official declassification process. Um, the Senate has the votes, I believe. The committee has the votes because it's still majority Democrat to, to, to approve the report. Um, and that, at that point, when they do vote on it, they will send it to uh, the executive branch for declassification. So all of this is still going to take, I'm assuming, months before we begin to see anything. But again, the president, the White House could accelerate the process and just just order it, um, you know, order it out soon. I mean, you know, this this is the part that gets really murky. Is it, you know, it, it raises the question: Is like, well, why haven't there been? Why hasn't there been a sort of a more? I mean, you know, my understanding is in November, uh, you know, following November, Senate may not control uh, the Democrats may not control that committee. And it seems quite clear that um, based upon the dynamic with, you know, um, uh, Richard Burr, uh, that there's not a lot of interest with the Republicans to release this report. Um, wh- why why isn't the, the the committee moving quicker to to sign off on it? I'm sure they are. Um, I'm sure the Democrats are very conscious of the clock ticking um, uh, because of um, of what you said, um, the Republicans uh, put it frankly hate this report. They uh, pulled out of dealing uh, of of participating uh, with the report years ago, with this investigation years ago. So they have characterized it as a kind of one sided smear campaign by Democrats against the Bush administration. So they would like nothing more than to just stick a stake through the heart of this report, and. Um, and so, um, yes, it would, behoove, it would behoove the Democrats on the committee to vote it out uh, sometime before uh, it, uh, they were to lose control of the committee. All right. So, so and let me ask you this. So, so based upon what we know uh, in terms of what the CIA has been up to regarding the destruction of the tapes, regarding, you know, Senator Feinstein is no— um, you know, wild-eyed uh, civil libertarian when it comes to this stuff, right? I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, a fair characterization. No, she's, no, she's been, a, right, I mean, she's been a very strong defender of intelligence agencies. So she is uh, convinced, at the very least, that the CIA was essentially, if not destroying documents, um, hiding documents from her committee, actively hiding them. Uh, she's also convinced that they are attempting to uh, intimidate her staffers and presumably her, right? Um, and so as a, uh, a citizen who's interested in, I want, really want to know what happened with this whole uh, program, um, how do I feel comfortable with the idea that the Senate has this report and then basically needs the CIA's permission to release it? <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, that's the um, that that is how the system has been set up, where basically stuff that the executive branch does declassification. Um, they have declassification authority. Now, there may be, and I, I so and and again, I'm I, I'm I, I want to be careful about saying too much about what I don't know. But the CIA, the the committee may have a authority to do a unilateral declassification. In other words, not have it to submit it to the executive branch. Uh, for declassification, but um, I don't uh, know enough about those authorities when that is invoked and whether they're considering doing it in this case. We we do know that they they could theoretically any given senator who has access to that report could just walk down to the Senate floor right and just start reading uh, the thousands of pages. Sure, but if it's a, if it's if it's still a classified, highly classified document, um, you'll 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 get a lot of senators who are worried about being hauled off to jail for doing that. I mean, as you you know, recall with with these various programs like the surveillance programs, right? Why didn't you all? We're afraid to right. talk about what uh, we have. Right, seen. they would say very oblique things, and then when Snowden came out and revealed these things, um, you know, they said, "Well, this is what I was talking about," but I couldn't say it. Right. So, you know, this is one of the things where the committee members feel hamstrung in part because they know too much and because they have clearances. Um, and so um, and I guess um, I guess Mike Gravel is still in, in retirement. So there's no um, we're not going to get anywhere with that. Uh, what what um, 
So, so what happens next? I mean, are, are we on the brink of some type of constitutional crisis? I mean, the the president was asked to address this yesterday, and he said, I've told Brennan, uh, I think we should declassify the report. That's all well and good. Um, um, but it's, he says it's not there yet. And I told Brennan he should take his conflict to the proper authorities. He didn't say anything about uh, Feinstein's perspective on that conflict. But who is he talking about in terms of uh, Brennan taking it to the authorities, taking it to the Department yeah, of Justice? Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, he, he, he was, he, he's right. He said that the authorities are now looking at it and um, did certainly didn't come to Senator Feinstein's side on this um, and then sort of reiterated what he had said before, which was that I want this report declassified. Um, but he wasn't saying I want it declassified tomorrow or I'm demanding it declassified right now. He's basically said, you know, I've told Brennan. Let's wait till after to- November. What's that? Right. So, I mean, it's um, th- uh, this is in line with, you know, the White House has, as I said, taken a somewhat hands off role here, um, at least as far as we can tell, in in wanting to, um, you know, not not step in and just and just settle the matter. Um, I mean, I, I think that, um, you, you know, your question of where are we headed? Um, I I think. I, I think that Senator Feinstein ultimately wants to get her report out. Um, she, uh, you're seeing a lot of public um, accusations back and forth, um, and it looks like it's really, you know, gathering momentum. But I, I do think that, you know, there may they they could end up working out something where um, they get the report declassified, and maybe this is part of her strategy to go public and ultimately to to make these accusations. Um, not that she doesn't believe in them, and not not that she doesn't think that they're legitimate, but she really just wants to get her report out. And I think you know maybe that will be um, a lever that she has to get it out. And so, and just a um, um, uh, last question, just when you look at uh, what President Obama standing back, right, and, and sort of um, hands off this type of situation, is he, is his sort of stepping back in some way uh, still putting uh, some weight on the scale? In other words, you know, I've got two producers in here. If one of them is uh, 200 pounds and the other one's 132 pounds, and uh, they start having a fist fight. And if I say, well, I'm just I'm just standing back. I'm not going to in any way influence the outcome here. Isn't that somewhat preordained? I mean, you know, the guy who's 200 pounds is probably going to win. Right. I mean, I think that I mean, so, so you know, again, stepping back, Obama has from the beginning, um, it is um, it's been well documented, um, uh, been very supportive of the CIA. Um, it has been a agency that has, in, in many ways, you know, thrived under Obama. Um, he has, and particularly the, Brennan too, right? Well, and 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 he's got this very close relationship with Brennan. So Brennan, um, as your listeners will no doubt remember, um, during the first term, worked in the White House as the president's top counterterrorism advisor, became very close with Obama, and then uh, uh, Brennan goes to the CIA last year, and so um, it's it is a close relationship. And um, it does give Brennan a good amount of authority, um, not only within his organization, but also uh, um, in, in, as you said, his dispute with the legislative branch. Uh, really fascinating stuff. Uh, Mark Mazzetti, a New York Times national security reporter, author of The Way of the Knife. Uh, we'll put a link to that book at uh, majority.fm. Thanks so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Sam.